Well, here we go. Since I need something to gesture at the wall with, I'm going to be gesturing with this handy dandy tomahawk. Available now at Kmart. That's a joke, they, they don't sell these at Kmart. I don't even think Kmart exists anymore. This video is not sponsored. You know, there are a hundred different book series that I could be doing this with. You know, my first very brief summary video was on Red Queen, and that was a series that people had requested I talk about in some fashion for years and years before I finally got around to it. And this time, I did not go with one people requested I talk about. I went with the Chemical Garden trilogy. Why did I do that, exactly? Well, something about it spoke to me. You know, like, I, I very easily could have done a different series that people have been requesting and that would get me a lot of views and that was better known, but just something about The Chemical Garden spoke to me. It is a story about a world where everyone dies very, very young due to genetic experimentation, and so rich men will kidnap young girls and forcibly marry them. Not sure what the connection is between those two things, but you know, that does happen. And the protagonist, Ryan Ellery, is a 16-year-old girl who has this happen to her. Okay, I, I need to cover this thing up. This is actually sharp. Now, meanwhile, outside of the protagonist, the entire world is falling apart and becoming a sort of Children of Men-esque dystopia. You know, society is collapsing from the weight of sheer ennui. You know, they, there's a lot of people who think there's no future, and so because of that they've become cruel and short-sighted. Or people want to fix things so badly that they're willing to use any means at their disposal, including torturing and killing innocent people in search of a cure. A better book series would probably focus on all of that. This one instead decides to focus on teenage pregnancy, sex carnivals, and Rhine just sort of existing. You know, just, just sort of being in the vicinity of things as they happen. In spite of the setup for this story, which, you know, sounds really nasty and unpleasant, very few bad things actually happen to Ryan at any point in this series. In fact, you could argue she suffers more in the backstory than she does in the actual story. So this isn't exactly suffering porn, uh, but it's also not focusing very much on her love story, and it's also not focusing very much on how things make her feel, it, yet, in spite of all that, she's key to saving the world. You know, she doesn't do anything, the story isn't focused on her, and yet she is the key to saving the world, in spite of her just sort of existing. Also, brief side note, uh, there is some sexual violence in this series, a, a lot less than you might think based on the setup, but there is some, however, it's pretty much all off-screen, or it's just implied, so I'm not going to talk about it very much, just you know, if you were wondering. These books, they, they just fail on every level, and yet they stand out in my mind. You know, they, they stand out. It feels like it was trying, I suppose, uh, but it didn't know what it was trying to do. <laughs> and I, I can't call the chemical, the chemical Garden cliched either, because it does do some unexpected stuff, but being unexpected doesn't mean you're good. The things that are unexpected in the Chemical Garden are unexpected because the plot goes nowhere and very few of the characters have anything resembling an arc. The only real standout in these books at all is the setting, which I, th I think, you know, the setting and the setup for the story are fantastic, but both of those fall apart under close scrutiny. And that's kind of what I'm known for, <laughs> is scrutinizing settings beyond what anything can reasonably be assumed to stand up under. Now, when I talked about doing this series a little while ago, somebody in my comments section said that this isn't the worst dystopian series that came out during the boom of the early 2010s, but it is the one that they're most surprised got made. And after reading the books, I have to agree 100% with that comment. Like, it's not the worst thing I've ever read, but I am wondering how a publisher looked at this and said, yeah, let, let's, let's publish that. Because after reading, I was kind of just left with a vague sense of, wait, that, that's it? That, that's all that happens? But at the same time, I was left vaguely disgusted and uneasy because, again, there is some unpleasant things that happen here, but not in an interesting way. And I, I don't know, I just feel that more people should know about this book series, but you shouldn't have to read it. You know, you shouldn't be forced to go through all that. And part of me is tempted to say, nothing happens in these books, because at times it does kind of feel like, oh yeah, no nothing happened in the Chemical Garden trilogy, but that's not true. Things do happen, 
they are just shown in the worst possible way they could be shown. You know, the protagonist never does anything, she just kind of stands nearby and then the story resolves itself. This is by far the dullest thing I've ever read. Not the most boring thing I've ever read, because it, it at least in this context, boring implies that nothing is happening. You know, I've, I've read tons of books like that. A lot of books I've read have been boring because nothing is really going on. Like, a lot of romance novels suffer from this problem. You know, it's really just characters existing in each other's vicinity, but there's not actually a conflict or anything, so just n nothing's going on, you know. That's what boring means. Dull means that things are happening, but none of them have anything resembling an emotional impact. You know, th these books contain kidnapping, sexual slavery, daring escapes from gilded cages, plans to save the world, and yet none of it matters because Ryan just doesn't participate in any of it. In fact, every problem, no matter who is behind it and no matter who solves it, every problem is solved super easy. Which, I, I don't know, by the end of this I was left wondering why it took several decades to fix the problem if the virus was that easy to, to fix, you know? There's also not really an antagonist, and by extension there's not really a central conflict, you know? The government isn't the antagonist, the society isn't antagonist, isn't the antagonist, the virus that kills everybody, that's not really the antagonist. Not even the evil scientist who kidnaps Ryan at the beginning, or her husband who she's forcibly married to, because the evil scientist and Ryan are on the same side, kind of, sort of, a little bit, and Ryan and her forcibly married to husband are kind of on the same side, uh, again, kind of. I, I don't know, it just feels like the author had the idea for the setup, but then she had no idea what she was doing or where she was going with things after the very, very beginning. From what I can tell, these books did sell pretty well when they were released, but they have not left any sort of impact beyond that. You know, very few people even remember these things. So I guess in a weird way, I am here to keep the memory alive. And, uh, uh, spoilers ahead, obviously. So before getting into the plot, let's just go over some important background information so that we all start off on the same page. The Chemical Garden is a trilogy. It's three books long. They are, in order, Wither, Fever, and Sever. Amazing titles, very easy to remember, very easy to tell apart. I totally did not need to read my notes to remember what order they went in. The series takes place a few hundred years in the future, uh, in what is now the United States, and most of the world is completely destroyed by floods and other disasters, or so we think at the beginning, leaving pretty much just the continental U.S. left. You know, that's the only bastion of civilization in the entire world. Now, around 70 years before the story begins, genetic testing created a generation of super hardy children who were resistant to most disease, and they are referred to as the first generation throughout the book. Throughout the books, I should say. Uh, they were fine. The first generation was fine. But their kids all died very, very young. Like, for females, they all die at the age of 20, and males all die at the age of 25. Absolutely no one lives past that. They think, they call this thing that kills everybody the virus, like just literally just the virus, it doesn't have an actual name, and everyone is dying, and so therefore city, uh, civilization is falling apart, you know? Cities and the countryside are being depopulated, the government barely functions any longer, like they mentioned more than once that the president is very much just a figurehead and he doesn't actually do anything. And uh, the new generations, the people who are born after the first generation, they can have kids, but again, they, you, they die when they're either 20 or 25, so that means their kids are very, very young when their parents die, which means there's orphans everywhere. And you might be thinking that, wait, this doesn't sound like a virus, it sounds like a genetic disorder. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. We get confirmation later on that, yes, it is a genetic disorder, but when it first came around, apparently scientists thought that it was a virus, so they just kept calling it that. And again, it's just the virus. <laughs> so lazy. Also, apparently, literally everyone in the United States got genetic modification done because we never hear about anyone who is unaffected by the problems that everyone else has, which seems unlikely to me. <laughs> given the way Americans are. There, there's a lot of them who will refuse to do it just because you ask them to. <laughs> or because you told them to. Like, they, they just want to be contrarian. And maybe we're not unique in that regard, but still, there would be a lot of people who wouldn't undergo this genetic testing. Like, either they would fake it, or they'd hide in the woods, or something. 
I just needed to get that out of the way. Now, in this world, in the present day, by the time the story takes place, it is common for young girls to be kidnapped and sold. The best-looking ones are sold as wives to rich men, and the less good-looking ones often get sold to brothels and then they have to work as prostitutes. Now, you might think that with humanity on the edge of extinction, fertile young women would be considered a very valuable resource, and maybe the government would just straight up kidnap them and force them into breeding facilities or something like that. But that would mean that our brave, delicate main character would be in an actually bad situation where she would actually suffer and, you know, we can't have that. We just want her to have dramatic stuff happen near her. We don't want her to be part of anything dramatic. The only advanced technology that we actually see or even hear about in this book series is the genetic engineering, and at one point we see a holographic t TV setup. Everything else is pretty much exactly what we have in the real world. So cars, planes, you know, everything like that. Now, our protagonist is Ryan Ellery. She is 16 at the beginning of the series, but it, the series takes place over the course of a little bit over a year, so by the end she's 17. She is originally from Manhattan, which is part of New York City, and her parents were scientists working on a cure for the virus, which is not an actual virus, uh, but their lab was bombed years ago and they were killed in the explosion. Now all that's left of her family is her twin brother Rowan. They have a house together because their parents left it to them when they, when they died, but they're barely scraping by with odd jobs. That said, they are still better off than most orphans. Now, Ryan is going to be represented by this picture because there is nothing actually going on inside her head. You know what, this thing sucks at pointing. Hold on a second. Now, Rowan is Ryan's brother and he's going to be represented by Osama Bin Laden. I can't tell you why he's being represented by Osama Bin Laden, but I can promise you that the reason will become clear eventually. Now, next up is her husband. His name is Lyndon, Lyndon Ashby to be specific, and he is 21 years old. Lyndon is a house governor in Florida, which means he lives on a gigantic estate with, you know, a mansion on it and tons of open land and gardens and stuff. And I've decided that he'll be played by Gerard Way because I want to make a My Chemical Garden joke. The joke has now been made. Now, at the very start of the series, Lyndon has three wives besides Ryan, so in total he has four. The first one is Rose, who he has been married to for a while at the beginning of the series and is actually very close to death from the, uh, from the virus. Okay, this thing's gonna put a hole in my wall. I, I need to, hold on. Oh, plastic training knife. You never let me down. The next wife to talk about is named Jenna. Now she's 19 and arrives at the estate along with Ryan. And I have to specify their ages because remember, women all die at the age of 20, so I'm letting you know exactly how close they are to death and how old they are in this world setting. Now, Jenna has a bit of real personality, but the story screws her over and never gives her anything to do before it unceremoniously casts her aside, so she will be represented by Jenna Ortega. The final wife is a 13-year-old girl. Named Cecily. Cecily is an orphan who was specifically raised to become some rich guy's wife, so she's actually kind of okay with being in this situation, even though Ryan is not. And she is also a redhead who's kind of stupid and annoying, so I've decided she'll be played by Lois Griffin. There's also Lyndon's housemaster who is named Vaughn. Now, at first, when I was reading, I thought that Lyndon was the boss, since, you know, he's, he's called the house governor, so I was thinking he was the boss and Vaughn was just, like, the manager of his estate, like, Lyndon owned everything. Uh, but actually, we find out that Vaughn is Lyndon's father, and Vaughn is the one that owns everything. So I'm not sure why Lyndon is called the house governor. You think he would be just the son of the house governor, or the son of the house master? Like, he wouldn't have an actual title, but whatever. Now, Vaughn is a doctor, uh, a very, very wealthy doctor, who owns most of the hospitals in this part of the country. Now, he has spent decades searching for a cure for the virus. We learned pretty early on that uh, Lyndon actually had an older brother who lived for 25 years and then died of the virus before Lyndon was even born. So, it does make sense how Vaughn would be desperate to search for a cure. He doesn't want to lose another child. Now, Vaughn is a Florida man who is, in layman's terms, incorrect at being human, so he'll be represented by this picture. If you know, you know. 
Now, like I said, a lot of girls in this world get kidnapped and sold. The people who do the kidnapping and selling are referred to as gatherers, with a capital G, because why bother thinking of an actual name? Just capitalize the first letter, and that, that's called world building. Yeah, it's, it's a proper noun now. But anyways, gatherers are not a single organization. That's just the term used for the profession. But still, they all wear gray coats. They do feature semi-prominently though, so I needed a picture for them. And since they love human trafficking, and they all wear gray coats, anytime one shows up, he's going to be represented by this Confederate soldier. There are also two big political factions in this world, the pro-naturalists and the pro-science people. The pro-science people want to find a cure for the virus, so, you know, they want doctors and scientists to continue researching. The pro-naturalists think that there's no way to ever find a cure, and so they should just give up on the experiments, which is stupid to begin with, uh, and then it becomes a little bit more understandable, and then it becomes really stupid again. That's about all you need to know at the start. There isn't exactly a complicated political landscape or a lot of lore to familiarize yourself with here. It's just a couple of characters, a very basic setup for a world, and let's go. So we start our journey at book one, Wither. We begin with Rhine, the main character, imprisoned in a dark truck with a bunch of other girls. She was taken a while ago and is being driven somewhere, but she doesn't know where. And I really can't tell if this line, which is on the very first page, is awful or amazing. The doors open. The light is frightening. It's the light of the world through the birth canal, and at once the blinding tunnel that comes with death. Like, there's actually a lot of lines throughout this whole series that are like that, you know? I don't know if they're good or bad, but they do stand out. Now, a young, wealthy man comes in and checks them out, who we, we later learn that that's Lyndon, but Ryan doesn't know that at the time. Now, all the girls are inspected. You know, they have their hips measured, their teeth checked. You know, basically, they're making sure that they are healthy, the way you do with slaves before you buy them. And after a little bit, Ryan, Cecily, and Jenna are all selected to become Lyndon's wives, and then they are led off into his mansion. The other girls are all brought back into the truck and shot. Ryan hears them, and the sound of their screams haunts her dreams, at least for a little while, but, you know, the important part is that the gatherers took all these girls who they already kidnapped and then shot them. But why? Okay, remember, young girls are valuable in this world. Like, the gatherers already went to all the trouble of kidnapping them, so why wouldn't they just sell them to a brothel somewhere? You know, like, we, we see later on that there are tons of those all over, and again, that girls who get kidnapped by the gatherers often wind up there. In fact, we learn later that Rowan searched for Ryan all over the place by looking in a bunch of brothels. Now, you could maybe say that this is like drug dealers dumping their stock before the cops show up so that, you know, they don't get in trouble, but there aren't any cops in this world. There are no legal consequences for the gatherers if they sell these girls somewhere else. And that would recoup some of their losses, or rather, recoup some of their expenses from gathering them. Because think about it, you had to gas up that truck, feed yourselves, possibly feed the girls during the trip if it lasted long enough. They had to spend time setting up traps or stalking their targets before grabbing them. You know, the gatherers would want to be compensated somehow, and maybe they're worried about families seeking revenge, but their families would be likely to seek revenge whether their loved ones were kidnapped or killed. Why am I giving financial advice to human traffickers? Why? why? This is what this job has done to me, guys. That said, this is a good opener. Pretty much the only good thing about this entire book. Now, Ryan and the two others get taken in a limo, uh, and then they get knocked out with gas. Now, Ryan wakes up in a very nice bedroom two days later and throws up, and she briefly converses with a man who cleans up her vomit, and she realizes, oh, okay, I haven't been sold to a brothel, I've been sold to a very wealthy man, you know, a house governor, as she calls them. Now, the servant who cleans up her, up her vomit is around her age, and he's kind of good-looking, and his name is Gabriel. Now, Gabriel has no personality at all, he's just the serving boy who Ryan falls in love with, so he's gonna be a plank of wood. Oh, I'm sorry, was that a spoiler? Did you think that there would be an attractive boy around Ryan's age who shows up early in the story that she doesn't fall in love with? Now, Ryan hears a woman screaming outside and asks what's going on, and Gabriel just tells her, no, just, just don't leave the room, okay? And she's, like, really mad, so she picks up a pillow and screams into it. And she specifically says it's out of rage, but she never displays any sort of rage later. 
She just, she's just mad at this point, and then later, she's not. Now, she goes out for a walk in the garden on the grounds, you know, no security or anything, she's just, she's just allowed outside, and later, though, she's confined to that wing of the house, like the, the floor that the wives live on, the wives' floor, and it's not as punishment or anything, that's just how they're kept, because the people who run the house think that they might run off, and they don't want them to do that, and yet, when Ryan first shows up, she's allowed out, and she doesn't try running. This doesn't add up at all. Now, Ryan is worried about her brother while this is going on. In fact, a huge chunk of this first book is literally just her being worried about her brother. And she thinks about how she wants to escape and go home, and then she starts thinking about how. Now, you may be thinking that this is the beginning of a story arc where Ryan explores the grounds, figures out its security features, and then devises ways around them. And you, my good watcher, would be wrong. That would be cool, but it doesn't happen. Now, apparently brides are sometimes flaunted in public. Like, Ryan specifically thinks that brides are flaunted in public, so she's gonna, like, charm her way into Lyndon's life, and then he'll take her out in public, and then that's gonna be giving her an opportunity to run off. Like, she she thinks that, like, twice and then never does anything with it. But, yeah, the brides are flaunted in public, you know, to the point where governors even just show off these girls that they have kidnapped on television. Why? 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 Okay, in this world, it is common knowledge that young girls are kidnapped and sold to rich men as wives. So you have a lot of very angry young people with no future, many of whom, whom probably know someone who was taken or killed by gatherers, and the house governors decide to flaunt the girls that they've kidnapped on TV. I'm sorry, that's a bad idea. That would lead to riots and uprisings. Like, that's a very good way to get an angry mob to come to your house and lynch you. <laughs> I'm really not joking or exaggerating. It makes no sense that they would do that. Now, Ryan does not listen to Gabriel. She leaves her room, and in another nearby room, she sees a very sick young woman named Rose. Rose is about 20 years old, so she's sick because she is right now dying of the virus. And the two of them talk for a bit, and they start to bond. Now, Gabriel comes back in, and then he tells R Ryan, Hey, you're not supposed to be in here. Get back to your room. Because apparently her door was supposed to be locked. Gabriel just forgot to lock it. Now, later, when Ryan sees him, uh, Gabriel has bruises and is limping, so we find out he was punished for accidentally leaving her door unlocked. We don't actually get confirmation of that, that's just what Ryan believes, it's, it's just conjecture, but I guess it does technically make sense. So Ryan does go back to her room, and like I said, the wives have their own floor. Here's a map of it. This, this is like an official map that the author released at one point. I, I don't know why they felt the need to give us this, because it's not like a particularly complex layout, but you know, it's there. Now, in the morning, some older women, who are from the first generation, wake Ryan up and they bathe her. And they remark how pretty she is, because she's the main character. Of course they need to remark how pretty she is. Uh, this is where we learn that she has heterochromia, meaning she has one blue eye and one brown eye, because again, she's just so special. And she gets dressed up all nice, has her hair done, has makeup put on, and then another girl, an attendant, whose name is Deirdre? I, I think that's pronounced Deirdre. I'm going to be saying it as Deirdre. She finds out that this young girl is going to be her new attendant, and Deirdre brings her over to Rose. Now, Deirdre, as her attendant, is basically her servant, and Ryan describes her as a little girl who's half her height. But Deirdre doesn't talk like a child at all. She talks like a 40-year-old woman who's been an attendant for a dozen, dozen rich girls already. So at first I was kind of confused. I was like, wait, is the author just bad at writing kids? Or is Deirdre, like, just really short? Or is she a dwarf? Now, later we do get confirmation that Deirdre's around 9 or 10 years old. So yes, the author is just very, very bad at writing children. Also, at no point do any of the characters or the book itself point out that it's kind of fucked to use children that young as your servants. Just, just throwing that out there. No, if you're thinking, that's bad, then that means you're still human, but the, the books never, ever stop and realize that. Now, like I said, Rose is very, very sick, and she's been receiving a lot of care around the clock. She's coughing a lot, she's very sleepy. Mentally, she's kind of out of it. Like, it's like the latter stages of cancer, almost. 
And uh, this is also where Rose mentions that they are in Florida. This, this is where we first find out. And that's very far from Ryan's home in New York. This is also where we first learn that the house governor is named Lyndon, because we saw him earlier, we just didn't get his name. Now, Rose is his first wife, meaning the most favored. And because Lyndon is 21 and Ryan is 16, that means they'll both die in four years, which is around the same time. So Rose tells Ryan that Lyndon bought her and uh, the other two wives because he really just didn't want to die alone. You know, he's losing the wife he actually loves, and so he just got these others as a shallow replacement. And it upsets Ryan because that is very objectifying. And yeah, honestly, like again, there's a lot of points early on in the books where I was on Ryan's side because she's upset and she, she was right to be upset. Uh, now, throughout the next chunk of the book, Ryan and Rose get to know each other and they become friends. At least we're told that they get to know each other and become friends. You know, we, we really just get a couple lines where Ryan says that they became friends over the course of the next couple of weeks. But, you know, we, we don't actually see most of it. Now, Ryan does not spend any of that several weeks of time uh, plotting her escape or thinking about revenge on the people who took her. She is literally just chilling with her new sister wife. Thrilling. Now, later, Ryan is taken to another wing of the mansion, which is a, a medical wing. It's like a small hospital that Vaughn has set up because, again, he is a doctor. And Ryan freaks out and passes out. I, I think she was just being taken here for an examination, but it's never made super clear. Now, while she's passed out, Ryan has a flashback to when she was 13, which is after uh, her parents were killed. In the flashback, a man breaks into her and her brother's house very, very quietly while they're sleeping, and uh, he holds a knife to Ryan's throat and then tells Rowan, do not move or I will kill her, and then he takes out a gun and shoots the guy. And we find out pretty quickly that the man was a gatherer. And he, they know that he's a gatherer because all gatherers wear gray coats. Why? Okay, wearing a uniform is typically something you do when you want to be easily identified. You know, these guys are criminals. They, they would want to keep a low profile. Or even if there's not actual cops or anybody to come after them, they would still want to keep a low profile so that their targets don't, you know, run away from them or have their guard up. They wouldn't walk around with a giant flashing neon sign saying, Hey, I'm dangerous! But, really, this flashback is just meant to clarify that this world is very dangerous and that Ryan has known she's at risk of kidnapping for, her, kidnapping for several years and that her brother is willing to go to great lengths to protect both her and himself. Like, again, he was 13 years old. He did not hesitate to blow that guy away with an actual shotgun. Now, Ryan wakes up and uh, nothing bad happened while she was in the medical wing and she gets made up by Deirdre because her wedding is soon. You know, that's the important part about books like this. We need to have a scene where the protagonist wears a pretty dress and gets to have makeup on so she looks super, super beautiful, but we also have to make it clear that she's annoyed by it and only doing it for the benefit of other people. If she liked being made up and having her hair done and everything, then that might make her look vain and we can't have that. So the wedding is very, very short, thank God. And the wives just sort of stand by Lyndon and then they recite their vows. And Ryan is the second one to say her vows. Like, it goes Jenna first because she's the oldest, and then Ryan, and then Cecily as the youngest. And I just want to point out that we're almost 50 pages in, and we're just now getting to the actual wedding bits. <laughs> this is also where we first hear about how Ryan's parents worked at a lab, and the lab that they were working at that was researching a cure exploded. And there is no further elaboration on this until much later. She just kind of thinks, yep, yeah, the lab my parents worked in exploded, and then just that, that's it. Now, at dinner, after the wedding, they finally meet Vaughn, Lyndon's dad and the housemaster. Now, Ryan deduces that he is the one who beat Gabriel earlier. We don't get actual confirmation of this, and Ryan comes to that conclusion, despite Vaughn not saying a single word to her, but, you know, like, I, I guess it's correct. <laughs> Now, again, this guy is supposed to be the villain. Vaughn is supposed to be the villain, the closest thing to a villain that not just this book, but the entire series has. And this is the first time that we're even hearing about him. <laughs> 70 pages in. Now, he's first generation, so he's pushing 70 years old at this stage, but he's aged pretty well, and genetic engineering means he lives longer, so he looks a lot younger, probably around 50-ish. Now, Ryan is worried about having to consummate her marriage with Lyndon now, because 
she's a virgin and the idea of, you know, having to have sex with this guy is off-putting to her. Understandable, given the circumstances. But we get confirmation that Lyndon is not going to consummate the marriage until after Rose dies. However, in spite of Lyndon's dick remaining bone dry, he takes Ryan on a walk through the garden. Isn't that nice of him? Almost makes you forget that he literally bought her. Now, this is where we learn that the whole world was destroyed in a war, except for North America. Or rather, a war and some other disasters, including flooding. Like, I assume the ice caps just melted. Now, Ryan feigns ignorance about the world, and Lyndon tells her about these things. He's really interested in history and architecture, but he also seems pretty distant. Again, remember, at this point, we hear that he literally only bought Ryan and the others so that he wouldn't die alone, because the girl he actually loves is on death's door. And you might be wondering why Ryan is feigning ignorance here and just letting Lyndon tell her things. Like, is she faking being stupid so he doesn't suspect her trying to escape or anything? Nah, she's just, just feigning ignorance so that she can have a conversation with this guy. Like, I, I don't know. Now, he says that the other wives are only there at his father's uh, insistence. I don't know if I believe that, to be perfectly honest with you, but that's what he says. Because of that, he is really kind to all three of his new wives. Again, you could almost forget that he engages in human trafficking. Now, after that, Ryan goes to the wives' floor, and actually, that's where she spends the bulk of this freaking book. I swear to God, it's so annoying. The wives aren't exactly imprisoned there, like, they have pretty much everything they need, they get food brought to them, but the only way out is an elevator, and that requires a key card to access. So, Ryan and the others spend months of their time there. They're just reading, watching TV, getting to know each other. Like, there's a lot of references to how Jenna likes to read uh, cheesy romance novels. That doesn't lead to anything, but there's a lot of references to it. And in spite of them spending so much time here, the wives' floor has zero presence in my mind. You know, it doesn't have any character or standout aspects to it. It's literally just the place where they live. Now, Ryan has another flashback to home, and basically there was a really cold night, and an orphan came to their door and asked to come in, and her brother Rowan just let the orphan freeze to death on their porch, and then left their body there for a while to serve as a warning for others. Rowan seems like kind of a psychopath. <laughs> Keep that in mind, because it is, it is relevant later, I promise. Now, Ryan, Jenna, and Cecily get to know each other a bit. Uh, we don't see any of it, just like with Ryan and Rose getting to know each other, but we get a few lines with Ryan saying they got to know each other, and so they, they became closer, and I guess that technically counts. Now, Jenna, as the oldest, seems really, really unhappy about this situation, but she also seems very resigned to her fate. You know, she's 19, she has less than a year to live, and she figures she may as well just wait it out in this mansion because at the very least, this place is safe and she'll be well-fed and well-cared for. Uh, we also find out that her sisters were kidnapped along with her and so they were all in the truck, meaning they were all killed at the beginning of the book. So it's easy to see how she just doesn't really see a point in escaping. Like, as far as we know, she doesn't have any other family or anything out there. She puts on a happy facade, but there is clearly a lot of rage bubbling below the surface. You know, she hates Lyndon, she hates Vaughn, she hates this house, and even if she doesn't want to escape, she very quickly agrees to help Ryan escape. Now, Cecily is left out of the plan, largely because Ryan finds her annoying. <laughs> That's pretty much her only real reason. It's just like, I find that girl annoying. I'm not going to let her in on my escape plan. Now, again, Cecily is 13 years old and spent her whole life up to this point in an orphanage and she was preparing for this sort of role. So she actually kind of likes being here. You know, like this is a nice place where, again, she's safe and well-fed and cared for and everything. So to her, this isn't so bad. Now, after months of just sitting around, Cecily gets bored of playing video games and watching old movies, and she wants to do something real, but she can't because they're not allowed to leave this floor. And, and at this stage, you might notice that a lot of things in the book just sort of happen. You know, they don't lead into anything. They aren't actually interesting in their own right either. Things just happen. Now, Ryan and Gabriel uh, flirt for a little bit, which seems dangerous to me considering you know, everything. Like, he's just flirting with his boss's wife, but 
what do I know? And now they're in love, I, I guess. That seriously is it. Like, there, there was nothing else to it. It's literally just, they flirt for a bit, and now they're in love. Like, there's no moment where they connect over something or realize that they like the other. It's just, they flirt for a bit, and now they're in love. Now, Ryan really clearly doesn't want to be here. Gabriel is an orphan who has nowhere else to go and has been a servant at this place for many years. They're just, they're just in love now. <laughs> now, finally, uh, Rose dies. Yeah, a thing happens in this book. Wow, I can't get this off. Now, finally, something happens, and Rose dies. She's gone. She, like, she succumbs to the virus. And, again, this is... At this point, Ryan has been here for, like, two months, maybe? We don't get an exact time frame, but she's been here for a while. And after she dies, Lyndon comes to her in the night and holds her and cries in bed with her and just falls asleep next to her. He doesn't try to have sex with her or do anything else. In fact, the entire book he doesn't try to have sex with her or do anything because... There's a moment the next morning where Ryan feeds him blueberries? And she doesn't hate him now, I guess. Ryan should really hate Lyndon. You know, he kidnapped her and he keeps her here against her will. Or at least... I, I, we later find out it was mostly his dad, but at this stage she at least thinks that it was Lyndon. Uh, but from this point forward she decides, you know what, Lyndon's not so bad. I, I think he's alright. And again, later we learn that Vaughn is the one who organized the purchase of the wives from the gatherers. Lyndon didn't know how they were brought to the mansion, even though, again, he was at the truck and was inspecting some of the girls there. Basically, Lyndon is really stupid, okay? He thinks they all volunteered. The important part is that he never does anything wrong. That way, Ryan can be attracted to him without feeling weird about it. But, again, at this stage of the story, Ryan doesn't know that Lyndon didn't do anything, so she really should hate him. Now, Cecily is starting to get really resentful of Lyndon, because he won't kiss her even though she keeps trying to kiss him. Did I mention that Cecily is 13 years old? Cecily, however, is convinced that Ryan and Lyndon had sex the night that he spent with her, and so she's really jealous because of it. Oh, don't be such a prude, Cecily says. So, did you consummate? She leans in. Was it absolutely magical? I bet it was. That line makes me uncomfortable in ways that I have difficulty articulating. Time to abruptly go to the next plot point. So Ryan tells Gabriel about how she was captured. Basically, her and her brother were tight on cash, so she went to a clinic to sell bone marrow, but it turns out the advertisement she saw was a trap, and so that's where gatherers were waiting, and they snagged her and took her to Florida. That's literally it. Now, uh, her and Gabriel are in the elevator at one point, and it drops to the basement, because apparently a hurricane is blowing in, and elevators drop to the basement, when a storm comes in as a precaution. I don't know enough about elevators to know if that's actually something that they do, but sure, we'll go with it. And they see men in hazmat suits taking Rose's body somewhere so that Vaughn can study it. Now, at this point, they told Lyndon, or at least Vaughn told Lyndon, that Rose had been cremated and he actually gave her some of, he gave him some of her ashes to spread. But, and again, remember, Vaughn is trying to find a cure to the virus. So, Basically, he's taken her body without permission and is going to cut it apart, do some sort of experiments on it. The morality of that is, yeah, you shouldn't take people's bodies without permission, even if they're a corpse, you know, that's still, that's still not okay. But this moment where they find out about it, this is, this is the ultimate betrayal as far as the book is concerned. You know, him lying and taking her body without permission, again, that's bad. But this is supposed to be, like, the worst thing he does in the book. The thing that really solidifies him as a villain, you know? Not him kidnapping and enslaving young girls. Not him beating Gabriel for forgetting to lock a door. Like, dissecting somebody who was already dead. That, like, that's where he crosses the line. And we later find out that he was actually giving Rose experimental treatments during all of this, and that extended her life by several months. So, I don't know, I feel like being able to look at her body and see how his experiments went. I, I feel like that's not that bad. So Lyndon and his three remaining wives start having dinner together almost every night. 
and I, I guess they start to like each other a little bit more. Uh, at dinner, they suggest visiting the nearby Orange Grove afterwards, and Lyndon is really sad because that was Rose's favorite place. Now, Jenna and Ryan are really uh, happy about seeing him be upset, even though Ryan liked him a few pages ago. I, again, I don't understand what the author was going for at any point in this series. Now, while this is going on, Ryan thinks about how going out to the grounds will give her a chance to look for the exit. Because the mansion is huge, but it's also on a massive, massive estate, and Ryan cannot see the edge of it from her window. And even when she's, you know, been allowed to look on, at the grounds before, unsupervised, even though she's not allowed to do that anymore, I, again, it doesn't make sense. But even when she was out before, she couldn't see the edge of the estate. So it's really big, and she doesn't know where to go to leave. Now, this whole time, the past couple of months that she's been here, she hasn't been doing anything to try and escape, remember. She hasn't been thinking of a plan, she hasn't been scouting out the mansion, she hasn't been stealing anything that would be useful, you know, like a screwdriver or other tools for bypassing security, a key card for the elevator, which, remember, she can't leave the wives' floor without one of those, you'd think she'd be looking for one, uh, money for bribing people or for trying to find transportation, weapons to, you know, fight people or take them hostage or, you know, something. She's not doing anything to try and escape. She's just occasionally thinking about how she wants to leave. And after a certain point, I just have to assume that she's okay being there and doesn't want to admit it to herself. So they go out for a walk at the Orange Grove and Ryan doesn't see any exit. A thrilling scene, I swear. Uh, we learn that Lyndon and Rose had a baby about a year ago, but the umbilical cord strangled it and so it uh, they don't have a baby anymore. Wow, I should really word that better. We learned that Rose and Lyndon had a baby about a year ago, but the umbilical cord strangled it and it died, so they were both looking forward to being parents and they were both like mentally very, very uh, badly affected, let's say, by the death of their child. Now, Lyndon, I guess, gets over Rose's death at some point during all of this, and then he starts having sex with Cecily. I don't know if you remember this, but Cecily is 13! You know, before the author Lauren DeStefano settled on the title The Chemical Garden, it was originally going to be called The Statutory Garden. Now, Ryan is upset with Lyndon, not for the statutory rape, though. Like, she's okay with that. She just doesn't want to let on that she's upset with him, so she pretends, sort of pretends, to be into him. Again, I don't know why she's upset with him, why she's not, I, it just, it really, none of this makes any sense. Now, a few days later, Cecily collapses, and they're all worried, and they take her to the hospital wing, but we find out that she's actually just pregnant, so she's a little bit sick right now. She's 13! My neighbors are probably really upset at me right now. I'm not apologizing, they're twats. And throughout all of this, Ryan and Gabriel continue to, I... I don't know, I guess they're falling in love, technically, in a technical sense. I know, he says, and I feel his arms shift. I've never been this close to him before. He's taller and sturdier than Lyndon, who is a few pounds away from blowing away. Hey, some of us have trouble gaining weight, you stupid bitch. Ryan tells him about home, and she considers letting him in on the escape plan, such as it is right now. Uh, again, there's no actual plan. Now, sometimes Ryan is allowed on the grounds unsupervised, so she looks around for a road. Because there isn't a road around anywhere. Like, again, the estate is huge, and Vaughn drives out sometimes, and sometimes other cars come and go, uh, but there's no trail or road that they take. Like, they just drive across the grass, and they never leave tire tracks in the grass. I'm not sure why it's set up this way, but sure, whatever. And at this point, Ryan has been here for about six months, and she is no closer to leaving than she was the day she arrived. Now, a hurricane comes along, and so everybody all shelters in the basement. And while they're there, Lyndon shows Ryan some of his uh, house designs, because Lyndon is actually an architect, or he's studying to become an archite architect. He wants to be an architect, but he's a little too young to actually be one. And they almost kiss, but she also thinks about how she hates him, because... Now, she has to hate him for this scene to have any point. Now, later, Vaughn actually tries to reassure her 
that he will find a cure for the virus soon. Now one day, another hurricane comes because, I mean, the weather in this world is kind of fucked in general. Like, hurricanes do hit Florida, but in the books they are much more powerful and much more frequent than they are in the real world, and they also occasionally get snowstorms and stuff. Just, just throwing that out there. But anyways, a hurricane comes and Ryan takes that as an opportunity to run away. So she runs out onto the grounds and she finds a little lighthouse, not a real sized one, but like a, a decorative lighthouse. And she climbs up a bit and she sees the exit gate. Well, she, so she sort of sees the exit gate, like some of the trees surrounding the property, including some of the trees by the exit, are holograms. Why? Why? <laughs> Is that just for aesthetic purposes? Is it to discourage a t escape attempts? Is it a desperate attempt to inject some drama into this book? I'll let you be the judge of that. So yeah, Ryan climbs up and she sees the exit and then she gets hit by some flying debris because she ran off in the middle of a fucking hurricane. And then she falls off and she might have died but Gabriel was there to help. And she wakes up later, she has a lot of injuries but she is alive. She's in the hospital wing of the mansion. And Vaughn actually tells her at this stage that Rose once tried to escape through the air vents when she was 11. Why did she go through the air vents? I'm not sure, there's not any actual security here, but Rose tried to escape through the air vents when she was 11. And he also tells Ryan that Rose's parents were going around saying that if they couldn't find a cure, then maybe there's people in other countries who'd be able to. But that doesn't make sense, the rest of the world is supposed to be destroyed. Uh, but they were all killed, her parents were both killed in a car bomb, and so after that he I guess he just took Rose in and took care of her and then her and Lyndon fell in love and then, you know, married and the rest is history. And this is the point where we learn about the two factions. Like, I remember I mentioned earlier the pro-science people and the pro-naturalists who think it's too late and that experiments on children are unethical. Like, it takes until this point before we learn about either of those. And then Vaughn basically tells Ryan that he knows she tried to run and he threatens her life and says, if you try to run again, I will hurt you. So... Ryan later tells Jenna about this and they're both like, yep, she's, that guy's bad news. And she, Ryan spends a little bit of time feeling bad for Lyndon because he has to live here and has this guy as his father. Like, shut up. One day while Ryan is in bed, her and Gabriel kiss and she has to keep it a secret. And Lyndon later wants to take her to an architectural expo and she sees it as a chance to escape. And she actually offers to let Gabriel escape with her and then this line comes up. I wasn't fighting for my life, I say, squeezing his hands. If I'd had my way, I would have died right there and it wouldn't have mattered. But do you know what keeps me going every day? That river, Rhine. I think my parents gave me that name for a reason. I think it means I'm supposed to go somewhere. This is me fighting for my life. I, I mean, it is confirmed that her parents named her after the river, Rhine. I, what? Now Deirdre almost catches Rhine and Gabriel together. But Deirdre is fine with it, and she won't tell, so that doesn't go anywhere. Deirdre does, however, tell a story about Rose and Lyndon's dead baby. See, when Rose went into labor, Lyndon was away doing... It doesn't matter, he was away being dramatic so that he could not be present for this part of the story. And the pain was so bad that Rose had to be sedated by Vaughn. And later when she came to, Vaughn said, Yeah, you had the baby, but uh, it died. And... Deirdre says that she heard the baby crying for a bit, which implies that it wasn't strangled by the umbilical cord and maybe Vaughn actually killed it. We don't get confirmation, but that, that's what they're saying right now. Now, Ryan does go to the architectural expo with Lyndon. Nothing happens there. Once again, she doesn't seem to actually want to escape. She just thinks about how she wants to escape sometimes. She doesn't look around for an opportunity. She doesn't learn the layout of the area outside the mansion. She doesn't seek help from anyone. Just, nope. Just, just she, she's just there for a bit. Now then, the two of them go home, and he asks her why she wanted to be a bride. Because again, he, he at this point thinks that she came willingly, even though, again, he was like inspecting all the girls, and presumably he did see his dad pay the gather. I don't know. This part doesn't make sense. Lyndon is stupid. But yeah, he asks her why she wanted to be a bride, and Ryan does not correct him. 
now would probably be a good opportunity to get help escaping, or at the very least tell Lyndon off and call him a dumbass and say he sucks or, su you know, something. But yeah, he just doesn't realize that her running off into the storm earlier when she got hurt, he doesn't realize she was trying to run. So this guy is both stupid and a pedophile, yet the book and the sequels are trying to make him seem like he's not that bad. Like, this book just has countless opportunities to have something happen, anything happen, but because Ryan is so devoid of anything resembling a freaking personality, nothing happens. Like, if she hated Lyndon and made a conscious choice to hide the fact that she hates him so that she could gain his trust and use that against him, that would be one thing, but she just has no thoughts or opinions at all except occasionally thinking that he's cute and kind of nice. Like, whatever story the author was trying to tell, having such a dull protagonist really, really detracts from it. And I'm sorry, I wasn't planning on going into this much detail regarding criticisms because this is really meant to be more of a summary with occasional criticism. It's just that describing the plot when there's basically nothing happening would get pretty boring very quickly. So the next day, Vaughn takes Ryan mini-golfing, and that's where we see that they have a mini-golf course and the lighthouse that she climbed is actually one of the obstacles there. And he shows her how to swing the club and actually touches her a lot during this, which she's very uncomfortable with, and if you're thinking that this is implying he has some sort of sexual feelings for her or the other wives, it, it's not saying that, I don't think. Like, he, he never tries anything with them. She's just uncomfortable with him in this one scene, and then it never comes back up. Now later, Ryan learns that Gabriel was taken to the basement and hasn't come out. And he's gone for several days and she starts worrying about him. But another servant brings her breakfast one morning and tells her to look in the napkin and there is a blue June bean in it. And that's supposed to be a message from Gabriel saying that he is still nearby. Now if you're wondering why there's a blue June bean, a lot of plants in this world are genetically altered and artificial. In fact, they mention that when they're walking around in gardens and stuff, they have a really fake sort of chemical smell to it. You might say that they're in the middle of a chemical garden. Now one morning, Ryan goes to speak with Jenna and she sees that her and Lyndon have actually started having sex. It, it is consensual, you know, Jenna at least seems into it. How long was he here? I say in a measured tone. Ugh, all night, she says and collapses back into bed. I thought he'd never leave. He thinks if we do it a bunch of different ways, it'll get me pregnant. I'm fighting not to blush. The Kama Sutra book, one of Cecily's favorites, is open page down on the floor. So yeah, Jenna doesn't seem super into it, but she's, like, being okay with it when he's there for... I, I don't know why, but I, I guess that is technically consensual. And for whatever reason, they're having trouble conceiving, but I like to imagine that Lyndon just doesn't know how to have sex, like he's just had a super sheltered life, so they're just hugging while naked and then he's wondering why she's not getting pregnant. Now, in the last book, like near the very end of the last book, we learn that Jenna is actually infertile right now because her uterus has a bunch of scar tissue in it. And from what I gathered, that usually happens when somebody has had either a miscarriage or an abortion, which implies a few things about her and her backstory. It's a pity none of those things are ever explored. But then, in spite of Jenna and Lyndon having sex now, uh, she says, Ryan says, that Jenna has held on to her dislike of this place for 10 months, which at this stage they've been there for 10 months. So like, again, I'm not sure why she's having sex with him if she truly hates him. Did he force the issue? If so, fuck him. But like, I just, I don't know. Like, does she hate Lyndon? Does she hate the circumstances she's in but thinks that Lyndon is okay? Is she faking being into him for some reason? Like, we, we'll never know. Like, we never know exactly what is motivating Jenna in this situation. Like, she's ten times more interesting than Ryan, but the book is committed to never letting us experience any of that. Now, Lyndon tells Ryan that the stress of the situation is getting to all of them, so he gives her a key card to the elevator which means that now Ryan can move about the house and go outside without an escort, even though she could do that earlier. But now, now she can do it. Yeah, that, that's great. And really, he's literally just giving her a means of escape. Like, she, she didn't do anything to earn it herself. Just Jenna convinced him to give her the means to escape. Awesome. And Jenna later tells Ryan 
that Gabriel has been permanently reassigned to the basement and they aren't allowed to go down there. And Jenna actually tried to find Gabriel down there earlier, but Vaughn kicked her out. And he also did something unpleasant to her that she won't talk about, and we never find out what it was, but he, it was something. Now, she agrees to make a distraction while Ryan goes to look for Gabriel in the basement. Now, Cecily goes into labor, which seems like it would be a good distraction, so Ryan would have a chance to go look for Gabriel, but she can't bring herself to leave. So she, she's just like there while Cecily, the 13, maybe 14 year old girl gives birth and the baby is still born or so it seems like he's fine in just a minute. So there was really no point to making us think that the baby was still born. Now they named the baby Bowen, which sounds a lot like Rowan. So I'm sorry if you get those two confused, but just remember Bowen is a baby. He never does anything. If anything important happens it, and you're getting the names confused, it's Rowan. Lyndon says he wants to have a baby with Ryan too one day. That, again, that never goes anywhere, but she finally, finally goes to the basement. It took a while, uh, but she goes to the basement and the only way she was able to get there is because Jenna set some curtains on fire as a distraction and Gabriel is just there. You know, he's just, he's just chilling. He's just working down there. And Ryan tells him she wants to run off and he agrees. And the plan they come up with is that when a garbage truck comes to take away waste, he will follow it to find the path out, even though they already know the path out. That's why Ryan went on the lighthouse earlier. And then Ryan leaves the basement with no issues. Now, soon after this, Jenna starts coughing and showing other signs of the virus. So she's reaching the end, which is weird because she's still not 20 years old yet. And she dies very quickly and everyone is sad about it. Okay, seriously, can I, can I not get this thing off? She dies quickly and everyone is sad about it. There we go. Yeah. There, there's a joke about me having trouble getting girls off there, but I'm not gonna make it. Now throughout this, Vaughn has not allowed Cecily to breastfeed Bowen because he, I, I think it's because he wants to keep them from bonding. I, I don't know why he wants to keep them from bonding. I guess it's really just because he's evil. Like it doesn't serve any of his ultimate goals at all. Like again, his ultimate goal is curing the virus and supposedly all this other evil stuff he's doing is in service of that, but like just, the, he's just being evil here. Now, Cecily eventually tells Ryan that she knew about the escape plan and she actually told Vaughn about it. And then Ryan realizes that, oh, Jenna didn't just die early from the virus, Vaughn killed her. And then she gets really mad at Cecily for ratting them out. And then she tells her off and runs off and Cecily is crying and very upset about it. Now, finally, Ryan and Gabriel just run off together in a snowstorm. Like, again, despite Vaughn knowing that they're going to escape, there's no extra security at all. They literally just run out the back door and run off. That's stupid! Use your common sense! I have gotten way too much mileage out of that clip, but you know what? Books need to stop doing stupid shit. Uh, basically, Ryan and Gabriel reach the outer gate and it's locked. Neither of them could have foreseen this obstacle. Who would have ever thought that the gates to a really big mansion full of expensive, valuable stuff, who, who would have ever expected the outer gates to be locked? So they just bang on the gates for a bit and then they're like, fuck, we're never gonna get out of here. But then a random attendant comes by and he says, hey, Cecily told me to come help you guys. And then he unlocks the gate. And this guy doesn't get a name. He never comes back, but he just, he's, he, he helps them escape. Now they run off the estate, go into the city, and they, they have no money with them. You'd, you'd think that they would steal some, or at least Ryan would steal some, but they just, they have no money with them. So they sneak into a movie theater and wait until morning. This escape plan is really shitty, both from a storytelling perspective and how easily it should have gone wrong. Because it's bad from a storytelling perspective because it required no work on Ryan's part. You know, she didn't come up with any actual plan like i don't know if you could call this a plan at all they literally just run out the back door like that, that's not even a plan really but it required no work on ryan's part there was no improvising when something goes wrong if security here was even slightly thought out then this would have failed wait i'm sorry i forgot there's one really really important detail to the plan that i didn't mention Ryan is actually in disguise when this is happening. 
Her disguise is that she puts in green contacts. That's brilliant. No one will ever recognize you with green eyes, Ryan. So yeah, Ryan and Gabriel steal a boat and then they sail off. It's, it's remarkably easy to steal a boat in this wealthy area. I guess they just left the keys on the dashboard. And then that's the end of the book. That's it. Like, that, that's the climax. Now we're on book two, which is called Fever. We start off with Ryan and Gabriel wet and running on a beach. Some authorities were apparently chasing them, so they just abandoned the boat that they stole earlier. Like, they jumped off the deck and then swam to shore and then started running. Uh, we later learned that they made it all the way to South Carolina, which is actually pretty far, uh, but, you know, they, they didn't make it all the way. What happens if they catch us, Gabriel says. They don't care about us, I say. Someone paid them a lot of money to make sure that boat is returned to them, I bet. I'm pretty sure they would want to catch criminals, but um, okay. And right after that line, Ryan thinks about how there's no police anymore. Tell me why. Okay, so there is a, a government still. It's not very functional, but there is still a government in this world. So they would want to protect property rights and the physical safety of people who work in the government as well as those who support them and keep them in power. You know, we find out later that the president of the United States and Vaughn actually know each other, and there's also a whole bunch of other rich people who still live in luxury while most of the population is starving. They would probably want someone standing between them and the angry mobs. And like, there, there are like private security forces, but none of them ever actually do anything. So like, why would they get rid of cops? I just, I don't understand. So Ryan and Gabriel make it to the beach and then they start watch walking. Ryan also mentions at this point she has some jewelry that she was wearing when she escaped. Remember how I said they don't have any money? You'd think she could have, like, pawned that. You know, sell, sell the jewelry, and then they could buy some bus tickets and then ride up to New York. Like, we, we learn in this very book, the buses are still running. Like, they take a bus later on. So, like, that was an option. <laughs> Why didn't they do it? Because they're stupid, that's why. That's why they didn't do it. So anyways, they see a Ferris wheel in the distance, and Ryan confirms that they have no further plan, because Gabriel asks her, so what's the plan? And she says, my only plan is to get back to my brother, like, verbatim, that's what she says. That's, that's a goal? That's not a plan? A plan is the steps you take to reach a goal? This is how words work, people. Christ almighty. So anyways, they see the Ferris wheel in the distance, and then they approach the Ferris wheel. It's in some sort of carnival or circus, like it has a bunch of lights and activity around it, uh, but it's also surrounded by a fence. And when they go near the fence, a bunch of people attack them and beat them up a little and then capture them and drag them inside the carnival somewhere. And they are taken to an old woman and she asks who sent them. And the woman calls Ryan Goldenrod, which is a type of flower, I don't know why she calls her that, but she does. Now, the old woman is named Madame Soleski. Usually she's just called Madame, or the Madame, though. And she actually dresses Ryan's wound for her. She wears gaudy jewelry. She switches between a bunch of different fake accents. Like, sometimes she talks like she's Russian. Other times she talks like she's French. Uh, she puts on a nice facade until you annoy her or defy her in any way. So you know what? Angelica Houston feels appropriate. Now... The madame tells Ryan that if she stays at her carnival of amour, uh, amour being the French word for love, then she'll be protected. And we learn that the carnival is just a really big brothel. Like, she's asking Ryan to become a prostitute. She figures out that Ryan was some rich guy's wife, and she figures out that she ran off with an attendant, and then she asks why, and Ryan says she started an affair with Gabriel because her husband was impotent. I'm not sure why she lied, this lie never comes back in any way, but, you know, she, that's what she tells her. And I'm also not sure why the madam asks Ryan to be a prostitute when she seems to force other girls into it. Like, she seems to have no qualms about that, but, you know, whatever. Now, she lets her and Gabriel sleep in a tent together, and Gabriel was beaten a lot more badly than Ryan was, so he's actually been sedated. Now, the medicine that Gabriel was sedated with was administered by a girl whose name is... Lilac. She's not actually that important, but you know, I'm giving her a picture anyways. She deserves it. The next morning, Madame Seleski takes Ryan to a tent where all of the other girls sleep during the day. You know, that they're prostitutes, so they usually work all night having sex with clients, and so they sleep during the day. And all of the girls are named after colors. Why? 
Why? Why not just use their names? You know, we're not, we're not trying to protect their identities here. You know, like, like a real brothel, if the prostitutes had a lot lives outside of it, then yeah, they'd probably want to avoid stalkers and stuff, so they would like give fake names to clients. That, that would make sense then, but in this situation, they, they don't have a life outside the brothel, they're just there all the time. So I, I guess maybe this is a way for the madam to dehumanize them and make herself okay with horribly mistreating them? I'm not sure though. Now, Lilac was first found by the madam a couple of years ago when she was heavily pregnant and she gave birth very quickly, and now she has a young daughter named Maddie. Now, Maddie does feature in this story, but she's a toddler. All toddlers kind of look alike. She doesn't need a picture. You know what she looks like. In fact, actually, a lot of the girls at this brothel get pregnant, and there's a lot of, like, small children running around. I guess condoms don't exist? Like... It's confirmed later that the government did outlaw birth control, but people find ways around every law. Like, you know, they, they would find illicit ways of getting, you know, condoms or other contraceptives. Plus, you could always pull out. And abortions are a thing. Now, the madam takes Ryan on a brief tour, and she has a multi-page monologue about how love is dumb, and then she tells Ryan that she's so special, because she's the main character, so she won't be having sex with clients. Now, she doesn't know she's a virgin at this point, remember. She just tells her, you're so special, you're not going to be having sex with clients. And later, when her and Gabriel are alone together, they are given aphrodisiacs against their knowledge, and they start making out, and they nearly have sex before they realize that Madame and some others are watching them. And this is when we learn that Madame does not want ha Ryan to have sex with Johns, she wants her and Gabriel to have sex in front of crowds. <laughs> Why? Okay, Ryan is a pretty girl. Why don't you just sell her for sex the way you do for everyone else? Hell, since she's a virgin, you could probably charge extra. As awful as that is to contemplate, you could probably do that. There really is no reason for this whole song and dance. It's just happening because the author had no idea what to do. So, Madam takes her on the Ferris wheel and, you know, continues giving her a tour and tries to talk her into it. And, I mean... Putting on a live sex show, sure, that does make some sense. I can see how that would make money. At first, I thought it was dumb that men would pay to be near a pretty girl and not have sex, but then I remembered that OnlyFans does exist. And I don't know who needs to hear this, but you're not actually chatting with her, bro. Right now, you are sexting with her assistant. Stop it. It really just doesn't make sense for the madam to try and force someone to perform when they don't want to. Like, just make her be a prostitute the way you've done to dozens, if not hundreds, of other girls. Like, again, the only reason this happens is because Ryan is the protagonist and we don't want anything bad to happen to the protagonist, because then the story might turn into one about trauma and how people re respond to trauma, and that might give Ryan a personality. That We can't have that. Plus, if she loses her virginity, she would no longer be pure. Please note the quotes around the word pure. Now, the madam gives her some birth control pills and says she can't afford to give them to all of her girls because, again, they're, they are illegal, so they're very, very expensive. I don't know if it would be cheaper to have a bunch of kids running around, but okay. Madame forces it into my mouth. Swallow, she says, her sharp painted fingernail gagging the back of my throat. I struggle and jerk my head back, and the pill has been swallowed before I can register what just happened. It hurts going down. Is this a fetish thing? Because it feels like a fetish thing. Madame continues trying to force Ryan to put on a sex show, and Ryan continues to refuse, but also feels like she has no choice. And one day, Lilac makes her wear a sari while they're walking around. You know, the thing Indian women wear. Sure, okay, she forces her to wear a sari. I don't know why. And Madame introduces her to a gatherer who is trying to buy her. I, I thought she wanted Ryan to, you know, put on a show, be a... J sure, whatever. She, now, now she wants to sell her to this gatherer guy. I should now introduce you to a man who lives at this carnival named Jared. He's seemingly the only adult man around, so he's de facto in charge of security, which means, you know, prevent the clients from hurting any of the girls too badly. Not prevent them from hurting them, but just prevent them from hurting them too badly. 
and he's also in charge of maintaining equipment, and he seems to be in a relationship with Lilac. His name is Jared. Now, Jared is present at this, that's why I'm bringing him up now. So the haggling for the Gatherer buying Ryan starts to get out of hand, and so Jared and the Gatherer both pull guns, and they shoot at each other. The Gatherer is killed, and Jared is shot in the arm, but is otherwise okay. Now, Madame starts hitting him in anger, and nearby is Maddie, Lilac's toddler daughter, who, I should mention, is somehow mentally disabled. We don't know exactly how, but she is somehow mentally disabled, and she's really, really attached to Jared, and so when Madame starts hitting him, she flies into a rage and attacks her. And then Madame starts savagely beating her for a while, and then others pull her off, and then Ryan and Gabriel grab Maddie and get her out of there. They run her outside the carnival, and they start treating her injuries. And then Ryan goes back in for Gabriel, and thinks now is the time to run, and then gets caught immediately, and then gets drugged because she's a dumbass. And then later she's awoken, and she's told, hey, Vaughn is here, he found you somehow, and he's looking for you. And she prepares to run off. Now, Lilac, in a desperate attempt to give any character in this book any sort of depth or complexity at all, she mentions that long ago, Madame's daughter was dating a respected do doctor, but she got killed in a pro-naturalist riot, which I guess is supposed to make her sympathetic, but it just, it's just so out of nowhere and so last minute that it doesn't. And so anyways, Jared, Maddie, Lilac, Ryan, and Gabriel all come together and they all run. And as they're running, they hear Vaughn calling out for Ryan. And he tells her, just come home and you'll be safe. All will be forgiven. And she runs anyways. And uh, Maddie, Ryan, and Gabriel climb the fence and run off. But as Lilac is climbing the fence, it electrocutes her. I, I guess that they just turned it on at the most dramatic moment. And so she's unable to escape the carnival. And Jared decides to stay behind with her as well. So... Ryan and Gabriel just take Maddie and they run off. Once again, their escape plan is literally just run off. There's no, there's no complexity or anything there. And if you thought that the bulk of this book would be at the carnival, I don't blame you. That's also what I thought, but we are only about one third of the way through right now. So they run for a while and they find a fortune teller named Annabelle and they trade her some strawberries to let them stay and give Maddie some painkillers and some medications, you know, help her with her injuries. And Annabelle gives Ryan a tarot reading. This leads nowhere. Uh, Gabriel is taking more painkillers. It's, it's referred to as Angel's Blood specifically. And it's starting to affect him pretty badly. This also leads nowhere. And then they set off on foot. And after a while, they see a delivery truck, which is heading to Pennsylvania. So pretty close to where they're going. So they jump on and hide in the back. And while they're hiding in the back, Ryan has some flashbacks to when she was kidnapped. You know, being in the back of a truck is reminding her of when she was in the dark for several days with all those other girls, and then all the other girls were shot, and apparently this is just triggering her flashbacks, so she starts freaking out a bit. Gabriel tries to calm her, and he does so by saying she's the smartest person he's ever met? Based on what? Her stellar ability to disguise herself? And if you're thinking that Ryan will be dealing with any sort of trauma or PTSD from her kidnapping or seeing others murdered, don't worry, she won't. It only affects her in this one scene. So then Gabriel starts going into withdrawals because, again, he doesn't have enough painkillers, and he says that before Jenna died, they spoke about how Ryan is super important and doesn't realize it, and then the truck reaches Virginia, and they get out. Why? 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 They were heading to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is closer to where they need to go. Why, why, why'd they get out now? I don't know. But they find a restaurant, and the owners agree to let them stay with them for the night, like they live on the floor above the restaurant. And Gabriel tells Ryan that Jenna knew Vaughn was going to kill her. So, she, like, Jenna had just kind of accepted her fate, basically. Why she didn't let Ryan in on this, I'm not sure. Uh, but then, in the middle of the night, Ryan goes to get a glass of water and runs into the owner of the house, whose name is Greg. Now, Greg is drunk and rambles about his dead son for a while, and then he forcibly kisses her and attempts to sexually assault her. Uh, but then Gabriel comes along, knocks him unconscious, and the uh, Maddie, Ryan, and Gabriel all flee. Uh, but Maddie also runs off into the night, and they aren't able to find her. 
and Gabriel also stole a bunch of this married couple's money. Again, he didn't steal from the evil scientist mansion, he didn't steal from the sex slave carnival, but he is stealing from the small business owners. <laughs> it's nice to see where his priorities lay. Like, uh, I don't feel that bad for Greg. Again, that guy was an attempted rapist, but his wife didn't do anything. But this is when Gabriel says, hey, we, we stole some money, it should be enough for, enough for bus fare. Again, they should have just done that earlier, but whatever. Now they find Maddie, it doesn't take anything for them to do it, they just, they just find her. They go to a bus station, buy some tickets, and then wait for a while, and Ryan breaks down in tears from the trauma of nearly being sexually assaulted. Understandable, but again, it never ever comes back. So they take a bus to New Jersey, and then they decide to stay a night in the motel, and you might think that something happens there, but no, nothing happens. Nothing happens at all in any of these frickin' books. I, I, I would say that about all, this whole series, just nothing happens. There's a setup for things that happen. Er, there's a setup for things to happen, and then nothing happens. I'm not redoing that take, just I'm, I'm annoyed, okay? So the next morning, they look around and they see the Statue of Liberty across the water. So like, they're, they're right there, they're right next to New York. And so they literally just walk to Ryan's house, and it's gone. It's been burned down. Likewise, her brother Rowan is nowhere to be seen, and it looks like he burned his writings at some point, and there's only a small scrap left. Crossbred flowers, psyllium, eggshells and chloroform, my sister's ideas, greenhouse gases, my mother's hands, 100 days, but still no sign. So yeah, Rowan was writing something, but it's, it's, uh, it's all gone now. And Ryan thinks about how her mother said she's stronger than her brother in important ways when, like, like back when they were kids, her mother said that to her because main character worship, I guess. And they look around for clues as to Rowan's whereabouts. They see dozens of dead rats in the basement. They've, they've been poisoned. And in the backyard, there is a trunk full of some valuable stuff that uh, Ryan and Rowan had buried there. And then they dig it up and some of it, most notably some seeds that their mother had as well as their parents' notebooks with all their notes from their experiments, are missing. So basically they conclude that Rowan took some stuff and left because he thinks that Ryan is dead. The president is in town. His name is President Guiltree. I mean, he's really only in this one scene in the story and he's mentioned a few other times, but he's only in this one scene. Uh, and so they go see him give a speech. He has nine wives. That's not relevant, but I wanted to bring it up. We also learn that the presidency is hereditary, and you might think that, again, the president is relevant at some point, but he's not. So he announces that they are rebuilding the laboratories that were bombed, you know, the laboratory where uh, Ryan and Rowan's parents worked specifically, and people are mad about this because conflict, you know, force contrived conflict is the best kind. People don't want to find a cure because the author couldn't think of an actual reason for people to hate each other. So some small bombs go off in the audience and then Ryan, Rowan, and Maddie all flee. Considering that the president is here, there's some really shitty security at this event, I gotta say. So they go to an orphanage and find a woman there whose name is Claire. And we find out that Claire is Lilac's mother. Also Lilac's real name is Grace. Now, how did they find this orphanage? Well, because Maddie has a children's book that they've read to her a couple times, and it has a Manhattan address written in it. So they just went to the address and like, oh look, it's Maddie's grandmother. Sure. So Claire lets them stay. She explains that Lilac slash Grace was kidnapped years ago. And there's also a boy there whose name is Silas. Now, Silas is about Ryan's age. He's only in this book for a little bit, and he's not in the sequel at all, but he's also kind of a love interest for Ryan, and he knew Lilac when they were kids, and you know what? He is going to be represented by this orange cat, because it doesn't fucking matter what I put there. So Ryan goes looking for clues to find her brother. For the first time in this entire series, she tries being a little bit proactive. She tries actually doing something instead of sitting around and going, wow, I wish I could find my brother. Maybe he'll just fucking stumble across me. So she goes around asking at factories where he may have worked, and eventually she meets one man who angrily tells her that Rowan stole a delivery truck and drove off several months ago. So that's all she has to go off of. Now Ryan is also seemingly getting sick for, with the virus, which is weird because she's only 17. And like her and Gabriel have been pretending to be married this whole time. Like Ryan is still wearing her wedding ring from when she was with Lyndon. And one day Silas realizes that the two of them aren't married. 
how. How do I explain it, he says. It's like there's an invisible cord on that wedding band, and it doesn't lead to him. It's like you're tethered. Walk off. Wow, author, that sure is a weird way of saying that you wanted to put in a love triangle, but you didn't want to put in any fucking effort. So Silas and Ryan find a dead girl in a ditch, and Ryan thinks, oh, that should have been me. Like, for some reason, she, she just thinks that. You, you could maybe say it's survivor's guilt because of, you know, Jenna or the girls in the truck, but this has never come up before, and it never comes up after. So she says she'll look for her brother when she starts feeling better, but then for a while she starts getting sicker and sicker, and she, she can barely get out of bed. And she realizes, while she's sick laying in bed, she realizes the mansion was bad because it was a golden cage, that she had no freedom. She was only there to be intimate, both physically and emotionally, with Lyndon. Didn't she figure that out before? No, really, I'm not trying to be snarky or sarcastic or anything. Didn't she already know that? Isn't that why she escaped? Or I refuse to say escaped. Escaped implies that there were obstacles. Isn't that why she ran off? So they look through some medical books to try and figure out what's wrong with Ryan, because it couldn't possibly be the virus, and they get nowhere. And Gabriel suggests going back to Vaughn to see what he did, but Ryan just refuses. It's a moot point, though, because Vaughn shows up at the orphanage very quickly, right after that. And he taunts her for a little bit, and he reveals that the, the wives all had these candies that they ate with their breakfast every morning, and he mentions that they had some chemicals in them. You know, the chemicals from his chemical garden. But Ryan had become dependent on the chemicals, and now she's going into withdrawals, and the withdrawal symptoms are just similar to how the virus killed people. And that's actually how he killed Jenna. He just, you know, took that away from her. I'm proud of it, Vaughn says. The concept is quite primitive. To prevent contraction of the flu, one would receive a flu shot, which is in fact a small dose of the flu itself. And so my thinking was simple. Replicate the symptoms of the virus and then administer them slowly over several years until the body works up an immunity. That is not how vaccination works. Like, you literally just described it, dude. You give them a small dose of the virus and then your body becomes used to it. You're not giving them the virus, you're just having them be hit with the symptoms so they wouldn't develop any sort of immunity. And again, as we learn later, it's not a virus at all, it's a genetic disease, so this wouldn't do anything no matter what. Vaughn, you're supposed to be a doctor. So Vaughn tells her to get in his car and he'll drive her back to Florida, and if she doesn't do it, then she'll die and he'll kill everyone in the or orphanage. And so she agrees to it, she gets in his car, and then she throws up and then passes out and wakes up back in the mansion. Ryan actually seems to pass out and wake up in other locations a lot in this series, but okay, whatever. She wakes up back in the mansion, she's in a hospital bed, and she is restrained. Understandable, she did run off once before. Now Deirdre is there, and she looks very ill. And apparently Vaughn is trying to make it so that girls can carry pregnancies before natural puberty. Sure, sure. And it doesn't work very well, so the girls, including Deirdre, who is one of his uh, test subjects, they keep having miscarriages. She's 10 years old! Okay, just... I, I need to say, 10-year-old girls, their, their bodies aren't developed enough to properly carry a pregnancy, even if they're technically able to. It's really bad for them, they're too small, it could kill them. Just, just throwing that out there. Now Cecily appears, and then tells her that she will help her escape. She's also pregnant again. And it turns out that before the wedding, uh, the doctor that, you know, inspected them, he actually implanted a tracker in them. You know, all of them. It was right under the skin of their thigh, which is, that's how Vaughn found Ryan. You'd think he would have found her sooner if he had the tracker, but okay, sure, whatever. Now Vaughn tells her, because again, she's the main character, she has to be special, he tells her she has genetic mosaicism, which means she has two sets of cells, which is why she has heterochromia. <laughs> now, this is happening over the course of days or weeks, but Ryan is drugged up in bed for all of it. And there's a scene where Vaughn needs to take some samples, so he just shoves a needle in both of her eyes. That, that was unpleasant. <laughs> but it was unpleasant on purpose, so I suppose I can't really criticize it. And finally, 90% of the way through the second book, Ryan does something! She finally does something. She takes action on her own. 
and she decides that she'll never be able to go home, but she refuses to be an experiment. So she gets out of bed and she tries to cut the tracker out of her thigh, and then Cecily and Lyndon find her. Now, Lyndon didn't know she was there and is actually mad at his father for hiding it from him, and then he takes her to a different hospital and they remove the tracker. And she explains that, yeah, I ran away from you, and Lyndon is hurt by this because I guess he couldn't figure it out sooner. And Ryan is also super sad that he's sad because again, she loves him now for some reason. Gone are my days of taking his love for granted. There is emptiness where that love once thrived. I was wrong about Lyndon's abandoning me. He wouldn't have given me to his father to be a guinea pig, but that's because he's kind and compassionate and not all at all because he has any love for me. Oh, shut up. Remember when he impregnated a 13 year old girl? This is really the dumbest love triangle of all time. I swear to God. Well, I guess it's technically a love septagon because we have Lyndon, we have his four wives, and then we have Silas, and we have Gabriel. So I, I guess, yeah, altogether there are seven people. Now they're talking and he says he's upset and he asks if she knows what it's like to lose someone that you love. And she replies, quote, I lost everyone I loved the day I met you, which is like a reasonable thing to say given the circumstances, but he's still a love interest of hers. So like, I. The author really couldn't decide if Ryan loved Lyndon or not. So she finally tells him that she didn't become his wife willingly, that Vaughn killed Jenna, and that he killed Rose and Lyndon's daughter, and that Rose's body is in the basement. And Lyndon is a sad boy about it for a few minutes, and then he leaves. And when he leaves, Ryan turns the TV on and is watching the news. So some pro-naturalists are mad about the attempts at a cure and are being interviewed at a demonstration, and one of the people being interviewed is Rowan. And Ryan's like, holy shit, that's my brother. And then the book ends and that's, I'm not gonna lie, it's actually not a bad cliffhanger. So book three, Sever, starts off with a bang. We get a revelation that Rowan bombed a hospital and killed a bunch of people inside because it was pro-science. Immediately I hate this guy. And now you know why he's being played by Osama Bin Laden. Like he's, he's just a terrorist. He's literally just a terrorist. <laughs> Ryan's brother is a terrorist. Now, Ryan resolves to leave the mansion and find her brother. Like, she later admits that she doesn't actually care about the terrorist thing. Like, her brother is all she has and she loves him. I'm no one to judge. There is no number of buildings my brother can destroy and no number of lives he can claim that would undo my love for him. Honestly, that is a pretty good moment of development for Ryan. It's just not focused on nearly enough to really make a difference. Like, honestly, th this could have been its own book. Like, trying to reach a loved one who's gone off the deep end and try and reconcile how you feel about them with their actions, especially if those actions are particularly heinous. But no one is really upset at Rowan for being a terrorist. Well, more on that later, but like, no one is upset at him for being a terrorist. So Ryan refusing to give up on, on her brother kind of falls flat. Like, I, I don't know, I, I guess the chemicals that she was in withdrawal for earlier are no longer a concern because her, Lyndon, and Cecily all just leave the mansion. And if you're wondering, well, wait, where did they go? Well, they went to Lyndon's uncle's house because he lives nearby. Vaughn doesn't try to stop him, he just sort of lets them leave. Uh, anyways, Lyndon's uncle, Vaughn's brother, is named Reed. He is a scientist, just like his brother, but he's also kind of a weirdo Prepper, prepper conspiracy theorist type, which I guess is kind of understandable here, like given the way the world is. So Ryan lives kind of out in the sticks, far away from anyone, and he never ever talks to his brother, but he does still love and care about Lyndon. And so he welcomes the three of them into his house. Now, Ryan and Cecily do take some time to apologize to each other, like specifically apologizing to each other about the death of Jenna because Cecily apologizes for being naive. She says that she liked it at the mansion because it was better than what she had before and she didn't think that telling Vaughn about the escape would get Jenna killed. And Ryan apologizes for treating her badly afterwards, you know, because again, Cecily was a literal child who had been, she'd been going through some shit, let's say, and she really didn't know any better. Like, they both acted understandably, you know, Cecily being naive and kind of stupid and Ryan blowing up at her for it. They both acted understandably. It was a difficult situation and they've both grown a bit. This is actually kind of a nice scene. Later, Vaughn comes back and then he 
takes Cecily back home because she wanted to stay, but her son is back at the mansion. Why she didn't take her son with her, I don't know. Lyndon also goes with her, so Ryan is now alone with Reed. And Reed says that the rest of the world is still there. It's not destroyed like the government tells them. And she's like, wow, what a weirdo. And a few days pass like this, Reed has a plane out in his shed. They don't do anything with it, he just says it's there. And also, Ryan does not do anything to try and find Rowan, you know? It's similar to when she wanted to escape in the first book. She just kind of thinks about her goal sometimes. She doesn't take any steps at all to reach it. Like, she doesn't listen to the news and map out his attacks to predict his next move. She doesn't think of how to contact him. She doesn't wonder why he's doing this and try to think of ways to get him to stop. She just thinks, man, I want to find my brother. Maybe he'll stumble into my lap, I guess. I don't know. So Lyndon does come back and he tells Ryan, hey, I'm going to help you out. Just don't run off on your own. And we learn that Reed left Vaughn's house and doesn't talk to him any anymore because he thought he was experimenting on Lyndon, which I don't believe is ever confirmed, but it also wouldn't at all be weird. Again, remember, he's trying desperately to find a cure for his son. Now, Lyndon and Cecily and baby Bowen all visit, and Ryan and Lyndon talk about what's happened a bit, and uh, again, I have to mention, she's kept her wedding ring on this entire time. Why? She is still attached to this guy for no reason. She has no reason to love him or even like him. Just sell the ring or throw it away. It's a symbol of kidnapping. But anyways, uh, Lyndon takes the ring off and then says that their marriage is now annulled. I'm not sure about the legality of that, but sure, whatever. They are on good terms, like at this point forward, they are on good terms, they are friends, but they officially do not love each other, they do not have romantic feelings. Now, Cecily has some really severe stomach pains, so they just drive her to a nearby hospital, and then she winds up living, but she does have a miscarriage, so that's, that's un unfortunate for her. She wakes up the next morning and then says, we're bad, we're condemning children to this world, because, you know, emo stuff, I guess. Uh, also, Ryan still kind of loves Lyndon and is jealous of Cecily in this one scene. She forgets about it later. Vaughn shows up and they think he had something to do with the miscarriage, but that's never confirmed, I don't think. And then they leave for Reed's house and Lyndon finally admits his father is evil. I don't know why it took him this long, but sure, he, he finally admits his father was evil. And then he says, oh yeah, okay, Ryan, for real, I will help you find Rowan and Gabriel. Like, I will do that for you. To be honest, I forgot Gabriel existed. <laughs> because Ryan doesn't seem to care about him. I know it isn't my place to ask what's gone on between the two of you, Lyndon says. Even before the annulment, I see now that I was wrong to expect all of your affections to be for me. It wasn't wrong of you, I say. We were married. Oh, shut up, dumbass. He's giving you an out. Now, he offers to teach Ryan how to drive, but she says she already knows how because her brother taught her on his work truck. Sure. A little bit later, they're listening to a radio broadcast, and it's doing a broadcast all about Vaughn. And it mentions that Ryan's parents were super important, great researchers. And then it explains that Vaughn is trying to follow in their footsteps, and it says, essentially, he's trying to give somebody a little bit of the virus to make them immune to the virus, and yes, that is literally the process of vaccination. Like, you, you described what a vaccine is. By the time this book takes place, the process has been around for hundreds of years. It's not exactly cutting edge. Anyways, Rowan is going around and he's actually announcing, giving speeches and stuff about how he was the son of those really important researchers we mentioned earlier, and people are skeptical for some reason. And this is when we learn that Ryan and Rowan's parents actually ran a bunch of nurseries for experiments where they were, you know, experimenting on kids and uh, young adults and stuff trying to find a cure for the virus, and they called it the Chemical Garden Project. I guess we had to squeeze that in somewhere. And another broadcast right afterwards says that Rowan has done another bomb bombing at a hospital, and he killed 14 people and injured a bunch more. Like, he's all upset about the experiments, and he says the experiments are more dangerous than the virus, because he's a dumbass, I guess. Like, okay, I will grant him that the morality of these experiments is sometimes questionable, 
but it's not worse than a 100% kill rate. Like, also, he's on the same side as the pro-naturalists. Like, they're the ones that killed his parents. You'd think that would come up at some point. You know, maybe he would be a little hesitant about working with them, or eventually decide that killing his parents was actually the right thing to do, but we just, we just never acknowledge that he's working with the same organization, or not organization, but the same movement that killed his parents, but sure, whatever. So Reed actually knows the guy who runs this radio station, so they go to see what he knows. And this is the point where I have to mention that Rowan, a literal terrorist who has blown up multiple hospitals and has a body count, is not being pursued by cops. Tell me why. Okay, even if the police no longer exist, we do get confirmation in this series that private security forces exist. Or there would be vigilantes who would be upset about Vaughn killing people, or maybe a bounty would be offered so that people would go after him. You know, like, the president or rich people who own the labs would want this guy gone because he is a threat to them. But he's not in hiding. He's like, out in the open giving interviews and giving speeches and shit, and no one's trying to find him. That's just, th that is probably the dumbest but also funniest thing in this entire series. So, yeah, they go to the radio station owner, and his name is Edgar, and they sh he shows them a tape of Rowan just giving a speech. Again, it's like in public, there's a crowd watching him, there's no cops or soldiers or anything. And Rowan, in his speech, says that he's pretty sure Ryan is dead and he thinks that the virus is better than trying to cure it. Now, why he thinks that she was killed in experiments instead of being taken by gatherers and just either killed or sold as a prostitute somewhere, I'm not sure exactly why he thinks that. I mean, I mean later we learn that somebody told him she was killed in experiments, but he has no real reason to believe that, so whatever. Anyways, Edgar says that Vaughn probably spread the rumor that people are being killed in experiments because he wants to be the one to find the cure. Like, he thinks terrorists will go after the other labs and then that will leave Vaughn with zero competition. So he's the one who gets to find the cure, even though I'm pretty sure the terrorists would wind up targeting Vaughn as well, but whatever. Now, all that said, I can see how Rowan losing his sister might radicalize him and cause him to act irrationally. Like, again, he's with, siding with the people who killed his parents, so you'd think that would, you know, make him be conflicted, because if the pro-science side killed his sister and the pro-naturalist killed his parents, that he should have some weird feelings about that. But, okay, whatever. I can get how it would radicalize him and cause him to not act totally rationally. And he also is in Charleston. So they decide, okay, we're going to go off and find him in Charleston. Now, Reed shows Cecily how to use a gun out in his backyard, and Ryan actually mentions that her brother used to grease the barrel of his shotgun to make it louder and deter people from coming to their house. Greasing the barrel of a gun is not how that... Uh, okay, fuck it. Now, Lyndon sees Cecily learning how to use a gun and is upset at her for holding one because it's dangerous, and he tries to tell Reed, how dare you show my wife how to shoot a gun? You're terrible. And then Reed shoots a, his gun into the air to assert dominance, and they start yelling at each other. And then Vaughn shows up, and Ryan hides from him for some reason, and then they pack up and leave, and Reed doesn't come with them, like uh, Ryan and some others, it doesn't even matter anymore, just decide, okay, we're going to Charleston to find my brother. Notice again how things are just happening. So yeah, Lyndon, Cecily, Ryan, they just drive to Charleston, and apparently that's also where the carnival that they were at in the last book is. And Ryan tells them about it and what happened, and they just drive past. Now Vaughn sends out a message on the radio saying he's looking for Lyndon. I guess Cecily disabled or took out her tracker at some point, but whatever. And they go to the remains of the hospital that Rowan recently blew up. And Ryan thinks about how her brother was there and she misses him. She doesn't think at all about how he murdered a bunch of people. You'd think that would cross her mind, but whatever. So some nearby people recognize them, and apparently Vaughn has offered a bounty for their capture, so they kidnap them. And they bring them to the carnival, and then the madame is there. She meets them. She explains that she actually knows Vaughn and met Lyndon when he was really, really young. She also reveals that she was Rose's mother. You remember Rose, Lyndon's first wife who died way back in the first book? Like, yeah, apparently 
Rose thought both of her parents died in a car bombing, but her parents thought that Rose died in that same car bombing. Like, Vaughn just lied to both of them because he thought that that would make Rose think she didn't have a family so she wouldn't run away. And also it would mean that her parents didn't come looking for her. So after realizing all that, Madame is now on their side and she wants revenge on Vaughn. So Jared drives them to another Scarlet District, another carnival, brothel, uh, which is owned by the Madame and happens to be nearby. And the nearest research lab is called Lexington, and Ryan thinks it'll be Rowan's next target, so she resolves to go there. So Ryan and Jared go there, they leave Cecily and Lyndon behind at the Scarlet District for whatever reason, and when they get there, Ryan describes that, like, oh, the town is really run down, and then this line comes up. The president will fund these establishments, but not defend them from threats like my brother. Oh, shut up. Just, uh, not, not Ryan. The book. Just, just shut up. You're not making any sense anymore. So, Ryan and Jared find a makeshift stage where a crowd has gathered to listen to Rowan make a speech. Like, again, there's no cops, no military, nothing. He's, he's just a terrorist whose identity and face are known and he's just in public giving speeches about why it's great that he's a terrorist. <laughs> uh, Rowan speaks briefly. Uh, off in the distance, the bomb goes off and destroys the lab, and then the crowd celebrates, and Ryan finally announces herself. She goes like, hey, Rowan, I'm here, I'm alive. And Rowan is really, really shocked to see her, but he's also very, very happy. And so he, she sends Jared to go back home, and then she goes off with her brother and some others. And while this is happening, Rowan, again, very excited to see her, tells her that a doctor told him that she was dead and encouraged him to blow up the labs. He also, in this one scene, he has a girlfriend whose name is B. And I have to mention her, but she never, ever comes back after this. Like, she was briefly mentioned a few times before this. Like, she didn't get a name, but Ryan noticed that there was a girl always standing near Rowan when he was on the news. And, like, she just, she just wasn't important enough to feature in the rest of the book. Now, Rowan does not seem suspicious or upset when he figures out that Vaughn lied to him. Like, he finds out Vaughn told him his sister had been killed in experiments, and he just goes, Oh, well, Vaughn must have had his reasons for lying. Bruh. That, that's all I can say. Bruh. So Rowan takes Ryan to Vaughn, and then Vaughn gets them in a limo, and they drive off. Ryan just goes along with this. She doesn't object or try to escape or anything. She just, she just goes along with this. And this is when Rowan learns that the two of them know each other, and he's surprised. And Vaughn just straight up says that he kidnapped her because she had heterochromia, and that means she was special. And the entire time while he's telling Rowan about this, Ryan doesn't, like, interrupt him or say anything. <laughs> she could easily tell Rowan not to trust him and go on about the abuse she faced and how he killed her sister wives, but, you know, that's, that's, uh, you know, she doesn't say anything. <laughs> Rowan hates the science experiments, and Ryan went through some, you know, most notably the needle in her eye, so he might be kind of upset about this guy subjecting his sister to those science experiments, but again, I guess Ryan would rather be a passive observer in her own fucking book. So Vaughn takes them to a private jet, and then they fly off to Hawaii, which was supposedly destroyed, but apparently is not. And on the way, Vaughn tells them a story about the world. And we learn here, through this weird exposition dump, that the American government banned a lot of stuff that caused diseases. You know, they banned certain chemicals, they banned tanning beds. Presumably they also banned cigarettes, but they don't specify. And the country just got cut off from the rest of the world. They shut down internet and other communication. And so again, the United States is just completely isolated. And eventually, they genetically modified people to make the first generation, like Vaughn, and then the virus appeared and everything collapsed. And Rowan knows all of this, and he's still not suspicious, he's not acting protective of his sister at all, which, again, very, very strange. Like, do you remember when he let a child freeze to death on their front porch to keep her and himself safe? Or when he killed the gatherer who came to their basement with no hesitation? Or when he blew up hospitals as revenge for her supposed death? Like... He's not acting protective of her anymore. Uh, also, Ryan is apparently unimportant to all of this. All this time during which Vaughn didn't tell Rowan and me about each other had nothing to do with me, I realize. 
I was just something to keep his son occupied and another body to experiment with. Rowan had the brains Vaughn needed, and Rowan never would have cooperated if he'd thought I was alive. He would have been too busy worrying about me. I... I don't think anyone involved in this book understands what Vaughn's evil plan even was. When they arrive in Hawaii, they see a woman who is definitely older than 20, but also definitely younger than the first generation, and Vaughn claims that people here don't have the virus. They've never even heard of it. So, uh, like again, the rest of the world outside of America is perfectly fine. <laughs> That's just a thing that is revealed right now. Now, Rowan is undergoing experiments of some sort. Just vague, science-y stuff happening in his, uh, in his vicinity. And uh, Vaughn goes on about Rose and her parents for a while. They were always out there, her parents. They lived like gypsies rather than civilized professionals. Boy, that sure is an interesting line, and not at all extremely fucking racist. This is where we get the confirmation from Vaughn that Rose lived several months after her 20th birthday due to his treatments. Uh, because he says that there are several cures for the virus. Again, virus, it's not actually a virus. Uh, there are several cures, but none of them are universal. They don't work for everybody. They only work sometimes. And so he's doing more experiments and trying to find a proper one. And also Rowan and Ryan are special somehow. Their parents made them for a purpose. I guess they were like genetically modified before birth. This part of the book has a lot of exposition and a lot of retconning in it. Like we learn the virus in males and the virus in females are completely unrelated. Sure, again, doesn't lead anywhere, but sure. Uh, Rowan shows Ryan their parents' notebooks and does confirm that they were in fact experiments. And so they leave Hawaii and they go back to Vaughn's estate in Florida. And Gabriel is there, remember him? Yeah, he exists. Uh, he's in an induced coma. And Vaughn tells Ryan to bring Lyndon back or he will never wake Gabriel up. He will stay that way for the rest of his life. So Ryan goes back to uh, Lyndon and Cecily at the Scarlet District and then they go to Reed's house to pick up Bowen because he's just been chilling there the whole time. And while they're there, Reed decides to demolish his shed and display the plane that was in there. And he wants to fly it. He's like, yeah, come on, guys, let's go for a ride. So they all, they all do. They get in and they fly for a bit. And when they land, it's, it's a rough landing. And so Lyndon actually smacks his head on the dashboard really, really hard. And he starts bleeding and they're like, hey, man, are you all right? And then he has a seizure and Vaughn is there. So he throws him in the back of his car and drives off with him. And... On the way to their mansion where he could get medical treatment, Lyndon dies. Like, yeah, for real, he, he dies. Ryan and Cecily are just devastated by this, so they go back to the wives' floor. And then they bury Lyndon, and Vaughn brings Ryan to Hawaii for some more experiments. And then she's unconscious for a week. And then she wakes up after a week, and then Rowan says, now there's a universal cure. That was very quick, number one. And number two, it required zero work from the protagonist. Isn't that fucking nice? <laughs> and Ryan is all sad and says, oh, I don't care. Again, why did she love Lyndon? I don't know, but she did. And then they immediately go back to Florida. There was, uh, there was no purpose to their trip to Hawaii, but they, they immediately go back to Florida. And Cecily becomes convinced that Vaughn is going to kill her. I, I don't know why she thinks that, but she thinks that. So Ryan sees Vaughn at Lyndon's grave one night, and she feels really bad for him. And to be honest, so did I. You know, like, he, he did a lot of horrible shit trying to find the cure, but he was doing it to save his son's life, and he had already lost one child a long time ago, and now he lost this other one despite all his efforts to save him. So, like, th this is the one moment where I, I really did feel a lot of sympathy for him, even though he was a horrible person. And so Ryan asks him why he killed Rose's baby, and he does confirm that, yes, he did kill Rose's baby. It wasn't strangled by the umbilical cord. He says that the baby was malformed, and he thought that she would die a after Lyndon got attached to her, so he killed her right away to prevent him from getting hurt. And he also confirms that Jenna was infertile, so he did experiments which killed her, which we already knew that, but okay. Like, you know, remember I mentioned Jenna had scar tissue in her uterus, like th this is where we learn it, this late in the series. And then Cecily steps out of the shadows and shoots Vaughn. Like, she shoots him and he is also dead now. Uh, apparently she got a gun from Madame for exactly this purpose. And she says that she did it because Vaughn killed Jenna, but hearing about Rose's baby is what pushed her over the edge. So 
I imagine that this whole time she's like been trying to hype herself up to do it because like, yes, this bastard killed Jenna, but she's couldn't bring herself to do it. But then she heard about Rose's baby and that that pushed her over the edge. So they wipe the fingerprints off the gun and then leave it there and then just go back to the house. And then later they pretend that they know nothing about what happened. Tell me why. Okay, but I'm not sure why they're trying to hide the murder because you don't need to cover up your crimes in this world. You could literally give a speech about how you murdered him and no one will arrest you. Remember? So the next day, the other servants all see that Vaughn is dead, which means that Lyndon is the owner of the house now, except Lyndon is dead, so now Reed is the owner of the house. So they wake up Gabriel from his induced coma, and they let Reed come back, and then uh, that's kind of the end of everything. Like, they continue the medical study, like some other people get the cure, and it works, and then Ryan and Rowan and other people who get the cure uh, get flown out to Hawaii once a month for follow-up tests to, again, make sure that everything works out. And Rowan understands why they killed Vaughn, like Ryan and Cecily tell him, I guess, but he's also upset because Vaughn did create the cure and therefore saved all of their lives, which is not, not wrong. You know, he's not wrong when he says that because Vaughn did some nasty shit, but he did save literally millions of lives. And a better book series would probably explore that. You know, people aren't just good or bad. We all contain multitudes, but sure, you know, that happens. And then a lot of time passes and Ryan turns 21 years old and is okay. So that confirms, yeah, the cure worked, at least for her. And it seems like Lilac and Jared go to Manhattan to be with her mother and with Maddie. Uh, and we hear nothing about Silas, but, you know, he's not important, I guess. And then it ends with a few pages of them just waxing poetic about how they'll keep the memories of those they lost alive, and then one day they'll go out there and explore the world in Lyndon's memory. And that's it. Like, that, that's the end of the series. The last book series I did this with was Red Queen. And while those books are bad and dumb and have long stretches of boring nonsense, things did happen, and I was into some of those things. I was interested in some of them. Like, there were villains with clear goals, there were heroes with clear goals, and they fought each other. The Chemical Garden doesn't even have that, you know? Like, th there's no actual story here. There is a plot in that there are events that occur, but those events don't mean anything and they don't really tie together in any real way. The inciting incident is that Ryan is kidnapped and then sold to someone and forced to marry him. Then what? You know, like... The, the, uh, there are events that happen, but like, what's the story actually about? It's not about her trying to escape. It's not about her falling in love with Lyndon or Gabriel, because her falling in love with Gabriel just takes so little freaking time. It's not about her trying to find a cure, because that just sort of happens around her. So what's this series about? It's hard to say. The only definable theme I can find here is that human trafficking is bad, which is true, but it's also not exactly revolutionary. You know, just saying, human trafficking is bad. You're not going to get a lot of people that disagree with you. And what's the conflict here? You know, what is the thing people are fighting over? There's several, really. First, there's escape the mansion, then escape the carnival, then reach Manhattan, then find Rowan. And then after she finds Rowan... I'm not even sure what the final conflict of the series is. You know, after she finds Rowan just sort of things happen and then the world is saved, you know? The only real through line here is Vaughn as the villain, but he always seems off to the side. You know, you, you ever notice how everything bad that Vaughn does in book one is just conjecture? Like in the first book, we don't get any confirmation of him doing things like poisoning Jenna. We do get confirmation later, but that's after he's established as the villain. You know, Vaughn had other labs destroyed and scientists killed so that he could be the one to create the cure, which implies that he's doing it out of ego, like he wants to be the one to save the world, or maybe he's doing it out of greed, because, you know, he'd probably make a lot of money from selling the cure, or maybe both. But then Ryan also claims that he did everything to save Lyndon because he also, he already lost one child. And I mean, if they focused on that, we could have had a very, very sympathetic villain, but his motivation is just so scattered that we don't even have that, you know? Honestly, I, looking back on the series, I feel like Vaughn should have been Ryan's husband rather than Lyndon. You know, he should have married her at the start of the first book. He's not a young, hot dude, so she's kind of skeezed out by him rather than with Lyndon, where she's like, oh, he's so cute and nice. 
and then Vaughn, as her husband, mistreats her, and so she decides to run, and the rest of the story unfolds. Like, that's the only way I can think of for him to feel like an actual villain, rather than someone who just appears once in a while when conflict is needed. And Ryan is never abused by her husband, Lyndon, in these books, which, you know, good for her, but it also prevents most of the threats that are posed in this story from seeming real. It makes her seem like, oh, she's just special just because, you know, the story's about her, therefore she's special. So this dark and gritty world feels much less dark and gritty because nothing bad ever really happens to the main character. She never seems like she's under threat. The best way I can think of to fix this series, really the only way I can think of, is in addition to, you know, Vaughn being Ryan's husband, just have the first book be about her escaping the mansion. You know, have her come up with a plan, work towards executing it, run into trouble along the way. You know, first she needs to find a way off the wives' floor, then after that she needs to find the exit gate, then she needs to think of a way through the exit gate, then she needs transport home, etc. Like, these are all problems, these are all obstacles that she would run into and she would have to find a way to fix them. Like, I'll admit, I, while I was reading these books I was watching the show Prison Break, and that's an example of that type of plot done really well. Like, check out that show if you're looking for inspiration about how to write any sort of escape story. Ryan also would have had to go through actual suffering in a better version of the story. Like, not necessarily getting sexually assaulted, but at least have the threat there because she really just chills for the entire first book. Or, maybe, part of the conflict could be that Ryan realizes yeah, she's a prisoner here, but she's been inducted into the ruling class of this world. You know, she is safe, she is well fed, she has luxuries that she couldn't have dreamed of before. And in exchange for that, she just has to have sex with her husband, sometimes, and then have a few kids. And to somebody like Ryan, who lived her entire life under the threat of starvation, or the threat of being kidnapped, and either murdered or sold to a brothel, like, this might seem like a good deal to somebody who lived under that sort of threat. You know, and at the very least, it would bring the world being horrible into focus. And then book two would have to focus more on the sex carnival, you know? Showcase just how bad the outside world is and why people like Vaughn are willing to commit horrible crimes to try and fix the virus. You know, it would strain the relationship between Ryan and Gabriel, or m maybe in this version, because uh, she's married to Vaughn, she actually has a forbidden romance with Lyndon and falls in love with him, Al although she would technically be his stepmom in this scenario, so maybe, maybe don't think too hard about that, but whatever. <laughs> you know, it would strain her relationship with him a little bit, there'd, there'd be at least some conflict. And then book three would be about the terrorism plotline, you know, go into detail about how Rowan and others began as normal kids, but they were turned into monsters by the world they live in. You know, they, they lost everything and then they lashed out. Maybe the climax is that they're about to bomb a lab that's working on the cure and Ryan is able to talk them down from it. Like, it, th this whole outline I'm giving is vague as fuck and would need a lot of flashing out, but at least it's something, man. <laughs> as for that whole thing with Lyndon marrying and impregnating a 13-year-old, just... Jesus Christ, man. Jesus. Jesus fucking Christ. I can accept that that sort of thing would be more acceptable in their society than it is in our society, but what really irks me is that the books don't dwell on how awful it would be for the person on the receiving end. You know, you can have a world with shitty aspects to it where the people there just think it's normal while still making it clear that it's shitty. You know, for example, in the Lightbringer books, slavery is totally normal and it's common to the point where a lot of characters think that society would collapse without it, like hero characters think that. And it makes sense that they would see nothing wrong with it, but we also see exactly how awful slaves are treated, and we understand that, yeah, this world is shitty for a lot of the people that live in it. This, the Chemical Garden feels kind of like if somebody with zero awareness wrote Lolita, and that's, that's not what a series should feel like ever. And if I had to sum it up, I would say that's what this whole series feels like. You know, it feels like it lacks self-awareness and it lacks identity. Because the book sold well. You know, many people read them, yet no one seems to remember them. No one ever talks about them. They left nothing resembling any sort of cultural impact. You know, as far as I can tell, there aren't any books that have been inspired by this to try and make something different or something better or even to try and cash in on its success. You know, Red Queen, for all of its many, many flaws, it has left an impact on culture. It inspired copycats, 
people remember it, people have fondness for it. Like, a lot of people in the comments section for my video on it were saying something like, yeah, these books are trash, but I liked them when I was younger, you know, I can't imagine many people doing anything like that for The Chemical Garden. And that's the thing, The Chemical Garden books have already faded from memory, and when this video is done, it's gonna fade even more. Like, that's all. There just, there is nothing else to say here. Anyways, uh, my next very brief summary is going to be on the Vampire Academy books, assuming that nothing changes, and my next, like, super in-depth book review, which will be before my very brief summary, uh, is gonna be on the Critical Drinkers trash heap of a book. Uh, that should be eventual. <laughs> it will be here eventually. But, uh, thanks for watching this far. This was longer than I intended, but goodbye. Uh, uh, the pa patron names, they're, they're on screen right now. Uh, my $10 and up patrons are Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayen, Brother Santotis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Dio, Echo, Jalal Dalul, James M., Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Michael and Katie Hake, Micaphone, Mistboy, Mitzi Mona, Roby Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Psych XS, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Toa Michael, Tesla Shark, Vevictus, Vimek Zoll, and Wesley. All these people are great. You can also see all the other names of other patrons on here. So if you want your name on here, and you also want like early access to videos, um, consider going over there, donating. If you don't feel like doing that, you can also become a YouTube channel member, and uh, you'll also get early access to videos. Doesn't that sound cool? Does, doesn't that sound awesome? Aren't you? You're all cool. Goodbye.